there are many instances of people having to withstand extremely miserable circumstances due to being placed in destitute life-threatening situations. Whether it be a sole plane crash survivor lost in the Amazon rainforest, or a crew of men trapped in ice at the South Pole, here are my top four cases of extreme survival and persistence. Number 4. Ernest Shackleton and the 27 crew aboard the Endurance. Englishman Ernest Shackleton was a renowned and celebrated polar explorer and had already once braved the Antarctic before he set out on the Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition in 1914. The Endurance departed southbound for Antarctica from South Georgia on December 5, 1914 and was headed for the Vasel Bay. Very soon ice was encountered which slowed progress and on January 19, 1915 the Endurance found itself frozen in an ice floe in the Weddell Sea. Realizing that she would be trapped until the following spring, the ship was converted to a winter station. She drifted northward with the ice for the following months and when spring arrived in September the breaking of the ice and its subsequent movements put extreme pressure on the hull. On October 24 water began pouring in and Shackleton gave the order to abandon ship. The crew was transferred to camps on the ice and on November 21, 1915, the ship finally slipped beneath the surface. For almost two months, Shackleton and his party camped on a large, flat ice floe, hoping that it would drift towards Paulet Island, approximately 250 miles away, where supplies were stored. After failed attempts to march across the ice to this island, Shackleton decided to set up a more permanent camp on another floe hoping that the drift of the ice would take them towards a safe landing. By the middle of March their ice camp was within 60 miles of Paulet Island but separated by impassable ice and they knew they'd be unable to reach it. On April 9, their ice floe broke into two and Shackleton ordered the crew into the lifeboats, to head for the South Georgia whaling stations which were 720 nautical miles away. The journey ultimately took 14 days and the tiny 20-foot lifeboats were in constant peril of capsizing in the stormy seas. On May 8 the cliffs of South Georgia came into sight, but hurricane-force winds prevented landing. The party was forced to ride out the storm offshore, in constant danger of being dashed against the rocks. On the following day they were finally able to land on the unoccupied southern shore. After resting a few days, Shackleton decided to attempt a land crossing of the island. Although whalers had previously crossed at other points on ski, no one had attempted this particular route before on foot. For their journey, the survivors were only equipped with boots they had pushed screws into to aid with their climbing, along with a carpenter's axe and some rope. Shackleton and crew then traveled 32 miles over extremely dangerous mountainous terrain for 36 hours to reach the whaling station at Stromness on May 20, 1916, finally ending their struggles. Number 3, Juliana Kepke. Juliana Kepke was born in 1954 in Lima, Peru to German parents. Her father a biologist and her mother an ornithologist opened a research station in the Amazon rainforest when Julianne was 14, and she became something of a «jungle child» and learned many survival techniques. She eventually had to return to Lima to finish her studies and she attended her high school graduation on December 23, 1971. The next day on Christmas Eve the 17-year-old boarded Lancer Flight 508 with her mother to unite with her father in the eastern city of Pucallpa who was working at the research station in the Amazonian rainforest. The flight started out as any other, when about halfway through, the clouds grew very dark and the turbulence got much worse. Suddenly the plane found itself in the midst of a massive thunderstorm. The plane was in a swirl of pitch black clouds and lightning lit up the sky. When a lightning bolt struck the motor, the plane broke into pieces and disintegrated in mid-air. Kepke, still strapped to her seat began free-falling and within a few moments lost consciousness. She fell 10,000 feet, almost two miles down from the sky and landed in the middle of the Peruvian rainforest. Amazingly she survived the fall but suffered a concussion, a broken collarbone, a bruised eye and a deep gash on her calf. 
it is conjectured that the jungle foliage and the cushion from the airplane seat saved her life. For the next 24 hours Julianne faded in and out of consciousness and when she started to feel better she set out to find her mother but after much searching was unsuccessful. In the midst of looking for her mother, Kepke came across a stream and remembered some survival advice given by her father. If you see water, follow it downstream. That's where civilization is. A small stream will flow into a bigger one and then into a bigger one and an even bigger one, and finally you'll run into help. She began her journey down the stream alternating between walking and wading. On the fourth day of her trek, she came across three fellow passengers still strapped to their seats but they were dead. Amongst the passengers was a bag of sweets. It would serve as her only food source for the rest of her days in the forest. It was around this time that Kepke heard and saw rescue planes and helicopters above, yet her attempts to draw their attention were unsuccessful. Due to the density of the forest, the wreckage was impossible to locate. What to speak of trying to locate a single person. The week-long trek through the rainforest started to take its toll on her body and her multiple wounds were becoming badly infected. She could see maggots crawling under her skin on her right arm. Nearby was a moored boat with a full tank of gas which gave her an idea. Kepke later stated, I remember having seen my father when he cured a dog of worms in the jungle with gasoline. I got some gasoline and poured it on myself. I counted the worms when they started to slip out. There were 35 on my arm that came oozing out. Luckily a few hours later nearby lumber workers found her, giving her first aid and taking her to a more inhabited area where she was airlifted to a hospital. After she was treated for her injuries, Kepke was reunited with her father. Sadly her mother and the remaining 89 passengers perished in the crash. Number 2, Aaron Ralston. Aaron Ralston was a mechanical engineer from Denver, Colorado who had a strong passion for rock climbing. In 2002 after just five years in the workforce he decided he wanted to devote more time to mountaineering and left his job. His ultimate goal was to climb Denali, the highest peak in all North America, and in preparation for this he planned to climb all 59 is, which are mountains with peaks of 14,000 feet or higher, in Colorado. Not only that but he planned on climbing all these solo and in the winter, a feat which had never been performed before. In April 2003 Ralston traveled to southeastern Utah to explore Canyonlands National Park. On April 27 at 9 o'clock on a Saturday morning Ralston rode his bike 15 miles to Blue John Canyon. At around 2.30 p.m. he started to descend into the canyon when suddenly a giant rock above him slipped. Ralston started to fall and his right hand became lodged between the canyon wall and the massive boulder, leaving him trapped 100 feet below the desert surface and many miles from the nearest paved road. Ralston was trapped in this position and didn't have any way to signal for help. Even worse was that he hadn't told anyone he was going climbing that weekend. His only provisions were two burritos, a candy bar, and a bottle of water. He tried chipping away at the boulder with his climbing tools but had no success. Pretty soon Ralston ran out of water and had to start drinking his own urine to fend of dehydration. He soon came to the conclusion that cutting off his arm would be the only means of escape and began experimenting with different tourniquets but he couldn't figure out how to saw through his bone. Ralston soon became very distraught and started to lose hope. He resigned himself to his fate and carved his name, his birth date, the day's date and the letters RIP into the canyon wall and then made a farewell video for his family. That night as he slept, drifting in and out of consciousness Ralston dreamt of himself with half a right arm playing with a child. After awakening Ralston felt the dream was a sign that he would survive this ordeal and go on to start a family. The dream gave Ralston the inspiration he needed and that morning he set to work with renewed hope. He now knew that he wouldn't have to cut through his bones but could break them instead. He managed to break his two large forearm bones, the ulna and radius, with the torque from his trapped arm. 
when his bones were disconnected he was able to construct a tourniquet from the tubing of his water bottle and cut off his circulation entirely. Using his cheap, dull two-inch pocket knife he was able to cut through his skin and muscle and then used a pair of pliers to cut through his tendons. Intelligently he saved his arteries for last, knowing that he wouldn't have much time after they were severed. All the desires, joys, and euphorias of a future life came rushing into me, Ralston later stated. Maybe this is how I handled the pain. I was so happy to be taking action. The entire process took only an hour, during which Ralston lost 25% of his blood. Euphoric, adrenalized and driven by the sheer will to live, Ralston climbed out of the canyon, rappelled down a 65-foot cliff, and started the eight-mile hike to his car. He was losing a profuse amount of blood and was severely dehydrated but somehow managed to keep a steady pace. Six miles into his hike he came across a family who had been hiking in the canyon. They gave him some cookies and water and quickly alerted the authorities. Officials had already been searching the area by helicopter but were unable to spot Ralston as he was trapped below the surface of the canyon. Four hours after amputating his arm, Ralston was finally rescued by medics. They believed that Ralston only had a few minutes left before he would have bled to death. Ralston's severed arm and hand were retrieved by park rangers following his rescue. The hand and arm were cremated, and six months later, on his 28th birthday, Ralston returned to Blue John Canyon and scattered the ashes where he felt they belonged. The dream that inspired his incredible escape turned out to be true. Ralston is now a proud father of two and in 2005 became the first person to climb all 59 of Colorado's 14ers, alone and in the snow. Not a bad feat for only having one hand. Number 1, Ada Blackjack. Ada Blackjack was an Alaskan native and member of the indigenous Inupiat tribe when she was hired by Canadian Wilhelma Stefansson to work as a seamstress and cook, on an expedition to the Wrangell Islands for the British Empire. Although Ada was Inupiat she didn't have any knowledge of hunting or survival skills and had a crippling fear of polar bears. She was raised by Methodist missionaries who taught her housekeeping, sewing, cooking and English for studying the Bible. Initially Stefansson had promised Ada that other Alaskan natives would be in the party. So she had many misgivings when she discovered she'd be shipping out alone with four men, Alan Crawford, Lorne Knight, Fred Maurer, and Milton Gall, along with the ship's cat Victoria. The promised salary of $50 a month was too good to pass up, as the odd jobs of housekeeping and sewing she was picking up in Nome, Alaska weren't enough to care for her and her sick son. On September 9, 1921, Blackjack boarded the Silver Wave with the four men and Victoria and with only enough provisions for six months. Stefansson has assured the crew that there would be sufficient game to augment their stores until the following year when a ship would be there to pick them up. For the first year the crew was fairly successful with their traps and hunting, but as summer came to an end, the once plentiful game disappeared and the pack ice closed in with no sign of a ship. Unbeknownst to the party, the teddy bear, the ship chartered to pick him up, had been forced to turn back due to impenetrable ice. As the weather turned, the expedition faced the reality that their inadequate stores would have to last another year. By the beginning of 1923, the situation had turned dire, the party was starving and the temperatures hovered around minus 48 degrees Celsius, and night was extremely ill with scurvy. On January 28, 1923 Crawford, Maurer and Gaul made the decision to set out on foot across the ice to Siberia in search of help leaving Blackjack to care for night. The four men were never found or seen again. For the next six months, Blackjack served as Knight's doctor, nurse, companion, servant and huntswoman but eventually Knight succumbed to his illness leaving Ada all by her lonesome. After Knight's passing, Blackjack refused to fall into despair and instead threw herself ferociously to the task of surviving. She drove driftwood into the ground to bolster the tattered walls and ceiling of her tent. 
she built a cupboard out of boxes, which she placed at the entrance, and in this she stored her field glasses and ammunition. Most importantly, Blackjack built a gun rack above her bed so that she would not be caught by surprise if polar bears ventured too close to camp. For three months, Blackjack was alone. She learned how to set traps to lure white foxes, taught herself to shoot seals and birds, built a platform above her shelter so that she could spot polar bears in the distance, and crafted a skin boat from driftwood and stretched canvas. She even learned how to take photos of herself performing work while in camp. On August 20, 1923, almost two years after first landing on Wrangell Island, the schooner Donaldson made landing, landed to rescue the persevering woman, who was doing quite well on her own. She strode out to meet the crew wrapped in a reindeer jacket she had sewn herself and she had a smile on her face that only someone who's survived against all odds knows how to wear. The men of the Donaldson were quite impressed and upon seeing Ada's finely tuned camp, they claimed she had so mastered the harsh Arctic environment that she and Vic could have lived there for at least another year. Shortly after returning home with Vic, the tale of Ada's long ordeal spread and the seamstress found herself at the epicenter of a flurry of press attention. She was lauded for her courage and praised as the female Robinson Crusoe, and many were greedy to recount her story to the masses. But the persevering lady shied away from the attention and insisted that she was only a mother who was eager to be reunited with her son. So this concludes my top four extreme survival and persistence situations. My name is Rob7389S, and I hoped you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching and see you next time.